Circle is a proud sponsor of the Internal Comms Pro podcast. As your company returns to the office and begins to form the new normal, employee communications are more important than ever. Circle Broadcast was built for internal communications and makes it easier to build a unified experience across email, internet, and mobile. To find out how Circle Broadcast can help you build your organization's bright internal communications future, visit circle.com slash comms. I'm Sarah Jackson. Welcome to Internal Comms Pro, the podcast. I'm on the road this season to talk to the experts that can help internal communicators face their biggest challenges. The time has come to raise the internal knowing of the value that lies within. Communications is, is two way. Um, talking at people, lecturing them, just pushing, pushing, pushing information without creating an, a, a mechanism to gather feedback and to have a dialogue. Um, it's self-defeating. I would say there's never been a time where the role of both crisis communications and internal communications was more valued. You're actually acting as an emissary and giving them a sense of, of what's the feeling within the company. The strength of the internal communications function derives in part by being able to bring together a diverse range of skill sets. Hello friends, we've been together all season and it has been so good connecting with you. Little did we know we'd be going through one of the toughest times in our history together. If you listen to this season, you know me well enough to know what I'm gonna ask you. Yep, how are you feeling now? If you're in the camp of exhaustion, overwhelm, or maybe you've just lost your way and you find yourself in this ongoing reactive state, this episode is for you. We're digging down deep and I reached out to someone that could help ground us, keep us rooted and remind us of who we are as a profession. Today, we're talking to Evan Neerman, founder and CEO of Red Banyan. Now, Evan is someone who started in internal communications, but his journey led him to uncover his passion and expertise in crisis communication. And on our episode, he shares all his secrets he has learned along the way. So grab a cup of coffee or hot tea, sit back, breathe, relax, as we learn how to root ourselves and to grow from surviving to thriving in this new landscape. Good morning. I'm Evan Neerman. I'm the founder and CEO of Red Banyan. Well, Evan, I looked up Red Banyan and of course, um, I wanted to know where the name came from for your company. So. Tell me, where did the company get its name from? I also thought that the banyan tree was a great metaphor for effective communication because it's lots of parts all coming together to form a really strong base, which is similar to how communications should be done properly. So tell me a little bit about your backstory. I mean, how did you become a crisis communications expert? Yeah, you know, I actually started as an internal communications expert. And my, my first job in Washington, D.C., I worked in advocacy. I worked for a nonprofit organization that was focused on foreign policy. And my role was really an, an, an internal communicator. And um, in the internal communications role, I was doing a lot of things that you would think of in terms of a typical position. Uh, working on updates to the internal staff, which was spread out between the headquarters and then offices uh, spread out around the country, letting them know about news and updates, helping to craft executive communications for the CEO and some of the other executives, speech writing, working on journals and newsletters and email updates and the website and website content. And fell into crisis communications really by, by accident. Uh, the organization found itself suddenly without warning in the midst of a crisis. And it was through no fault of the company itself. The company had done, the organization had done nothing wrong, but they had someone who came after them 
and fed a story to the press. And next thing you know, in, as what often happens in crisis situations, it snowballed and it moved very aggressively. And so they brought in a team of outside experts who were crisis communicators. And because I was the principal internal communications person, I was working directly hand in glove with the crisis consultants. And what I learned from that experience was this is the area of communications where I want to be next. Uh, I loved the fact that the value and the skills of the communicator were held in the highest esteem and that if you communicated effectively, you could truly influence the future direction of the organization and you could protect good companies, good organizations. So when I, when I left my first job, I left to go work specifically at a firm that focused exclusively on high stakes and crisis communications. And so I did that and it, it gave me the opportunity to work directly with high profile CEOs and political leaders and foreign government leaders. And that was how I made that transition from internal communications to crisis communications. I love that because, you know, part our mission here at, at, you know, the internal comms pro collective is we are trying to collectively raise the value of the internal communication industry. And what might seem as a time period in history that's pushing internal communicators under the water, you talking about the, you know, your experience is offers, I think, a paradigm shift for internal communicators that this moment is, is a great opportunity to show more than ever the value of this industry, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I think this is, this is probably, while unfortunately, uh, obviously this pandemic is, is so debilitating and so harmful in so many ways, economically, emotionally, mentally, um, taking the lives of people here in this country and all around the world. And that's all very tragic and very negative. Uh, the silver lining and the flip side, trying to look at the glasses half full, I would say there's never been a time where the role of both crisis communications and internal communications was more valued. And you have a large, uh, the, the public, which largely I think doesn't understand communications, doesn't necessarily understand the value of communications, whether that's internal, external, crisis communications. They've seen now firsthand because they've been on the receiving end of so much outreach, much of which coming from internal communicators. So I think the, the COVID-19 pandemic has, has created an opportunity for internal communicators to showcase their value to their bosses, to their colleagues, to their customers, and really illustrate why this is such a critical role within any organization. What are you hearing out there? You know, since you do work with internal communicators every day, what is the pulse of, of and your sense of how they're, they're personally feeling and, and professionally feeling? What's, what's your general take on, on what you're seeing out there? In a word, if I were going to describe what, how they're talking about their day-to-day -day existence right now, it would be overwhelmed. Overwhelmed in that uh, they're having to do more work and it's at a higher stakes threshold than perhaps they're accustomed to before. And there's just such a need to communicate. And at the same time, it's becoming really, really hard to know what is the right cadence of that communication. Should I be communicating more should I be communicating less? Am I inundating them? And I think people are, are really wrestling with uh, trying to figure out how to connect with people in a way that's, that's useful and valuable, uh, but also doesn't then become uh, just more noise and that those communications don't get lost in the shuffle. And I think a lot of organizations are really wrestling with, you know, how are we going to reconstitute how we talk and how we communicate with our target audiences in a remote environment, which comes with its own challenges. 
Okay, y'all, I gotta interrupt here and give you a warning. This episode is a little longer than you might be used to, so if you need to push pause, jump back in after tucking kids in bed, answering that email, getting up to pee, it's okay, we'll be here when you get back. We're gonna be talking about so many valuable things and laying out a roadmap with tips that relieve pressure for you and help you get above all the work that has been thrust upon you. Now you know me, we've got all the steps on a downloadable cheat sheet at internalcomspro.com, but if I were you, on this one, I would get out a notebook and a pen because as this episode unfolded, I uncovered additional insights and they all couldn't make the cheat sheet. So settle in, get out your pen, and let's get going. I want to get into sort of some steps, a roadmap today that that you have provided and that we're going to go through where they can, it will help them with their self-confidence and, and almost hopefully transition them out of this reactive surviving to really getting on top of some of this stuff and, and thriving, um, on all of this amazing value that they have created. So tell me a little bit about this roadmap and what we're going to be, um, kind of going over today. Sure. I'll, I'll take you through a couple of, of key steps on that roadmap. And, and I just want to underscore from my perspective, you know, a, a map typically is, is something that's designed to take you from point A to point B or from A to Z with other steps along the way. Uh, the roadmap, which I'm going to talk about, these aren't necessarily in a specific order, meaning you don't need to follow step one before you get to step two. You could be taking multiple steps concurrently. So I just don't want there to be a mistaken impression that, that it's sequential. Instead, I'm going to provide you with just a handful of ideas of, of ways that internal communicators can really seize the moment and make themselves more valuable than ever before to their colleagues and their customers and clients. The first point I would, I would say is, uh, you know, assure the team that the health of the organization is strong because people are uncertain and they're feeling overwhelmed and they really need to hear from the organization that things are going to be okay. And so conveying that sense of stability and letting people know the world is not coming to an end. Yes, the world as we know it has been upended, but the organization's not going anywhere and we're strong and we will get through this. And just infusing your communications with that approach will help enormously. That's one. Okay. So when I'm doing that, and so I'm the communicator, I'm sitting in the the room with my business continuity team or leadership, what questions, if we're going to dive deep into this, do I ask to elicit from leadership the, that kind of feeling of that we are here, we are strong. What, what would I, how would I get that out of leadership to be able to convey that message? One thing is asking a lot of questions and asking the, the questions of, you know, what is the plan? What is the plan for business continuity? Do we have a plan? If you don't have a plan, my recommendation would be come up with a plan quickly before you communicate to everyone that you do have a plan. That goes without saying. Um, I think you also want to want to probe a little bit about understanding the steps that the senior leadership is taking in order to shore up the stability of, of the company. So, you know, putting this in concrete terms, I can relate a specific example uh, from our own work recently where it was just vitally important that the CEO spoke to the entire team and basically conveyed listen, I want to let you know, we, we're going to be disrupted. There's no doubt about it. I'm being very transparent about that. At the same time, I want you to understand the following steps that we're taking in order to ensure the continuity of our business. We're applying for the PPP loans through the federal government as stipulated by the CARES Act. We've increased our line of credit at the bank. We've done X, we've done Y, we've done Z. And conveying those concrete steps and giving people hard examples of the, of the steps that the organization is taking go a long way toward being convincing. So when someone gets a communication from the internal communications team, 
it's not just rose tinted glasses, take our word for it, everything's gonna be okay, rah rah team, it's rooted in reality. And by that, you're giving some specific examples of what the organization is doing in order to strengthen its financial position, its cultural position, its, its uh, expanding into new offerings, really probing what are you doing now and what do you intend to do and showcasing that to a, a broader audience. Okay. That, I, li- I love that. There's a, and I think to remind the internal communicator, when they go into that room, the the leadership might not have a plan that that this is where i feel like there's a such an opportunity and a self awareness of the internal communicator that they are the leader in that situation if they don't have a plan well let's talk through it to get some sort of semblance of a plan or or leadership might not have the awareness that okay when we put all these steps together then this feels like a plan and i think with them being connected to the employees, they can keep asking the questions until they get enough information that is going to evoke that feeling of stability. That's a very good point. And look, what one of the things that internal communicators have going for them, and this occurred to me as, as you were talking just now, is you know, we, we have the benefit as, as internal communicators to couch our remarks as, I, I expect I'm going to get these questions from the staff these are the types of things I'm hearing. So then it reduces that likelihood that, that say you're, you're posing these questions to a senior vice president or the CEO, it becomes less that you're asking as a way of attacking or calling into question or being negative or expressing your own reservations. On the contrary, you're actually acting as an emissary and giving them a sense of, of what's the feeling within the company. And that's very valuable. Uh, to senior management. And it, it's another way uh, that you can perhaps ask uncomfortable questions by framing it as, I expect we're going to get questions about X or Y. And it, it gives the internal communicator the confidence to, to ask some of those tough questions, knowing that they're, they're serving as an emissary or a voice uh, for the larger staff. Evan, I love when we give words to to that are so empowering to the internal community that is good i expect i'm going to get these questions because i think even them saying that repositions them from a there's a lot going on in that moment between them then and leadership because if if i have someone that's saying that to me and i'm the leader then i feel that i trust them i feel like they're looking at has a second set of eyes for for leadership and for the company and for the employee it just repositions them through the process of them just asking that question in that way that's so good oh i love this okay give us the second step next is is really being process oriented and establishing processes uh, that allow the internal communicator to connect with various members of the staff which will help them in terms of navigating this uncertainty. Getting into a routine of ongoing communication. It could be as simple as uh, a daily update that comes in the form of an email. It could be a five minute huddle that the person does. It could be a meeting that's cross departmental. It's really just getting into a, a process and a routine and systematizing it so that people come to expect to hear from the internal communicator. And it's not just ad hoc or, you know, you get two communications in one week and then you don't hear from the person for two weeks. For two weeks, um, it just creates a, a regular cadence and helps people also see that the internal communicator is playing a vital role in keeping everyone apprised of the latest information. So let's dive a little bit deeper into this one. So how do they get a feeling of what is should the cadence be? Our governor has done a great job um, of coming up with in the beginning, we were we, he would address our state at 10 a.m. and four. And, ev- and in the beginning, we needed twice a day. And now it's at five o'clock. And so he backed off a bit. So but but there was a point when he backed off. And I wonder when they got that sense that that was OK. Talk a little bit about how do they muddle through finding the cadence? Well, part of it is going to be, what do you have to say? And what you don't want to put yourself in a position of is communicating at a high cadence, but where you're adding low value. 
So you're calling people together or you're pushing out a communication, but there's not a lot of value for the people or you don't really have any news or updates. So, you know, at, at a certain point to use your example, the governor and his staff, either because they had fewer updates that they had to give or because the plans that they were putting in place were being executed against, or perhaps they were also hearing from people or seeing a, a drop off in terms of listenership or or engagement. I think it's a little bit of a, of a cloudy process. There's some ambiguity here. Part of it has to go based on the gut feeling of the internal communicator, but then I, th I think there are also things that you can do to, to gauge whether the communication is too much or too little or just right. And specific things that you can do to do that would be one, if you're, if you're pushing out communications uh, through email, for instance, it's very easy to look at the open rate. And if you're finding that your open rates have gone from, you know, the high 80% down to 20% or even less, you see a, a precipitous drop off. It's an indicator that people are not really opening or caring what you're trying to tell them. They're caring about what you're trying to tell them in the email. The other thing you can do is just, uh, have conversations and, and internal communicators should be having conversations with people across all the departments as often as possible and simply ask the question, do you feel like you're getting what you need? Do you have questions that are, that are, that you have that are not being answered for internal communicators? Our audience largely are our colleagues. So they're there, they're a resource and we can go straight to them and hear straight from the proverbial horse's mouth how they feel about the cadence and the value of what's being provided to them. Staying connected with all of your employees is more vital now than ever. Circle is excited to announce the latest addition to our internal communications platform, Circle for Mobile. With Circle for Mobile, you can send essential employees and crisis communications straight to your employee audience. Break through the noise to keep your employees in the know and safe. Find out more at circle.com mobile. We're halfway through Evan's roadmap, and in this next part, I get super excited about the fertile ground for innovation this crisis has unearthed for us. You know, I wanted to know more about banyan trees after hearing Evan's company name. Turns out, banyan trees can grow out of these crevices and out of some of the most difficult places. And so when we find ourselves in this time period of history that we're in, we're in a tough place. But there can be great growth. I mean, Look at me, I'm growing and learning. I have no idea if you're going to listen to a podcast that's 30 minutes or if you're going to listen to this one. It's going to be almost an hour or over an hour long, but I'm going to find out. And that's what's so great about our community. We can all learn and grow together. So let's dive back in and see what else is on Evan's roadmap. All right, so what's the next tip you've got for us? The next one is maintaining a sense of connectedness among the team and creating opportunities for people to communicate with each other. So we're social creatures and that's, I think what's been part of the, what's been hardest about the isolation that comes with sheltering in place or social distancing is we as humans crave interpersonal interaction. And so even though you're in the context of a work environment, it's still very valuable uh, because we're not machines just performing tasks. We're people and people have feelings and emotions and a need to connect with the people who are in their lives day to day. And let's face it, we spend a lot of time with the people we work with. In some cases, we spend more time with them face to face than we do with our own children or our spouses. And so for that reason, it's it's really vital to create avenues where people can share and they can connect and it needs to be online largely now because it needs to be virtual, but you could do it through setting up a dedicated Slack channel. Uh, you could do it through creating lunch and learns or happy hours via zoom or Skype or FaceTime. Uh, there are different ways to bring people together, even though we're physically separated. So, all right, I want to get into this is, you know, I'm hearing this from internal communicators that they they this immediate need for connectedness is trumping 
the internal comms typical need to have perfect communication going out as well. Are you seeing more that that it's the uh, this crisis and that need for connection sort of has humanized uh, the communication where everyone is okay with it less polished? Yes, absolutely. And look, if you're gonna if you're gonna pick like a a quirk of of internal communicators, it's it's that we often uh, do find ourselves wanting it to be perfect or wanting to tweak it and adjust it and rethink it. And before we actually hit send, check it, recheck it, uh, and think about it from every different angle. And I think the COVID-19 crisis has absolutely lowered the bar in terms of what's permissible communication. I mean, for a, for a primary example of that, look at some of the most highly produced communications that we see, such as you know, The Tonight Show or Stephen Colbert or Jimmy Kimmel, their shows, they're literally broadcasting from inside the homes of the guests. And yes, they've set up home studios. They've had, you know, techs come in and, and create a, to a degree uh, lighting and whatnot that makes it at least uh, passable. But you also see tons of, of celebrities and other folks who are social media influencers who are communicating with a broader audience simply with an iPhone in their bedroom. And if anything, we've seen that that's okay. And if you, if you watch the news, you have people filing reports um, and doing the reporting from a variety of different places. It's no longer you know, well-lit stand-ups in front of iconic backdrops. There are people just taking footage from anywhere they can. And so it's, it's, a little hard for us to get over that hump of wanting it to be perfect and look just right. But as you said, uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And if it's good, it's good enough, move it, move it out and engage. Cause that's more important. As you said, it's that need for connectivity and responsiveness trumps whatever production value we may feel like, like we need to, uh, to, to add to a project. And, and I don't want them to miss this moment because if they can get their leadership used to um, this less than perfect, that process is is the basis for innovation. So they are really setting up this great environment by having it be messy and not perfect for other things. And it almost gives them the freedom now to set up this learning environment for when they want to go test new software or new strategies, or let's try to contract this out because they're getting the trust of leadership. Um, they are, you know, showing their value, but they can get a little bit more leeway and rope to kind of screw up and fail. Cause now this is just part of the process of their learning and innovating. I just don't want them to miss what a amazing hotbed of just new it's a new environment, I think, to create and work. So. Absolutely. And, and you know, the biggest obstacle is often, well, we've always done it this way in the past. Well, that argument has fallen flat because none of us has ever experienced anything remotely similar to what we're enduring right now. So it's an opportunity for sure. And they're trying to get out the information that employees have to know while they are balancing the less than perfect videos and making employees feel connected. And I would think going the back and forth of that can be exhausting. Any tips for how do you balance both of those needs of the internal communicator? It feels heavy. It's heavy, but look at the end of the day, if, if there's vital information uh, having to do with continuity of the business, like our office is reopening or our hours are changing or this product is not going to be available until further notice. Those are important communications that, that need to take precedence and priority. And at, at the end of the day, you, you have to juggle a lot of competing inclinations and a lot of needs. But I think start from the ones that are most fundamental and the ones that uh, are going to inform your target audiences of vital information that they need to have and make sure that you're you're checking those boxes before you're moving on to the fun stuff like setting up uh, five o'clock happy hours 
uh, company wide for people to hang out and Okay, that's good. So get a priority uh, hierarchy and then start there. I love that. All right, what's your next tip you got for us? Yeah, I'd say remember the importance of storytelling. Uh, we like people remember stories. People are inspired by stories. And we, we there are stories to tell and they're not all bad news. And when people are sitting at home and they're, they're absorbing lots of information coming at them. For weeks and weeks, we've been getting lots and lots of bad news. And it's been very much doom and gloom. Part of that, I think, is just the nature of what sells in terms of the media. And it's a lot. And I think people are experiencing a, a bit of fatigue of all this bad news, and they're ready for some good news, and they're ready to turn the corner. The shock is starting to wear off. Um, and storytelling and pointing to positive things really does make a material difference. And that can be, you know, to get granular on it, you know, it could be uplifting messages about people at the company who've gone above and beyond during this time, uh, showcasing uh, individuals, showcasing departments that have done something exceptional. It could be recognizing the leadership of, of key decision makers. It could be uh, calling out People who, even as simple as so it's, you're coming up on someone's you know 10 year anniversary at the company. This isn't really how anyone would picture celebrating their 10th anniversary with their colleagues by sitting at home and working uh, working over Zoom. But telling these stories and keeping people connected, I think, is is really key. I love that. And any tips on, you know, if they are remote. I mean, is there, are they going to have to go back to the good old days of like, how do you get the stories now? I mean, is it, you got to find the employee and figure out, I mean, how, how are they getting these stories with the nature of being disconnected? So sitting back and waiting for people to come to you with stories is, is a guaranteed strategy for failing colossally. It's just not going to happen. I, I think after doing this kind of work for 25 years, people who are not communications folks don't think in terms necessarily of stories. They don't think about what makes for a good story. And they, they're not thinking about the application of something that's happening in their department uh, on a, on a company-wide level or even beyond. And I think it's up to the internal communicators and it's a responsibility to be asking questions, sharpening your, your ability to ask questions and to listen and keeping your ear open for things and, and listening for nuggets because the, there's always a story. There's always something interesting. But if you don't take the time to probe a little bit and to look beyond the headline and to actually pick up the phone and call someone or to schedule a quick face-to-face -face over Zoom with them and ask a few questions. It's when you ask the question and then you just sit back and let them talk that you can often uncover a hidden gem, which really uh, is something that the person doesn't even realize that they're holding on to, uh, but the internal communicator can identify and, and turn into something really valuable for the company and uplifting. I love it, I love it. All right, take us to the next one. What do you got for us? Yeah. The next is, look, communications is, is two-way, um, talking at people, lecturing them, just pushing, pushing, pushing information without creating an, a, a mechanism to gather feedback and to have a dialogue. Um, it's self-defeating. And so you really need to be looking, and, and, and this, this hinges on what we were just talking about. It's, it's being willing to ask the questions, asking people you know, what are you experiencing right now? What, what for you is the biggest hurdle that you're having to overcome? Being able to ask those questions and understand and looking for feedback gives people the chance to not just be absorbing what the company is pushing at them, but actually gathering uh, their input, which is extremely valuable. So how do they actively listen? I mean, are we talking are they sending surveys? I mean, I know you talked about if they've got tools that give them analytics to now's the time to be taking advantage of really diving into those analytics as signals. But what 
when you say actively listening, give me, give me some examples of how can they do that? Basically creating a plan of attack in terms of talking to people from a diverse range of departments within an organization. So thinking about the organization, not as through the lens of just focusing on, on one aspect, but looking at all the different parts that make up the whole and scheduling time to actually speak with and ask these questions of people in a variety of different positions and at different levels around the company. Just asking the senior leadership and scheduling a time to talk to them, it's gonna give you a very warped view, but if you're talking to the senior leadership and you're talking to managers and you're talking to new hires and you're asking them questions about uh, how they're feeling, how do they feel? And, and again, analytics are great, but so much also in, in communications can't necessarily be quantified and getting some of that anecdotal information, it's invaluable. So really just being willing to, to think, not just of going to the same sources, but seeking out actively people who maybe are underrepresented or don't really have a voice. And the internal communicator can help empower them and give them a voice and collecting these different perspectives also prepares the internal communicator so that when they are sitting in the boardroom and senior management is having a conversation, they can convey information that they've gleaned from their conversations and bring that to the table is really valuable feedback. I love it. And as I'm sitting here, you know, if they already are feeling overwhelmed under the water and then there's all these great ideas, even just in the, the few short minutes we've been talking, is there a practical tip here to give the internal communicator of how they organize their days or their, their week so that they're using all these different parts of their brain? For example, is, you know, Monday interview day, like when you're, when you're helping someone through a crisis, is there a, a practical, this is how you should structure your time and day that, that we can um, give insight on that can help get them out of survive into this thriving mode. I don't know about you, but I want to get out of survival reaction mode. I want to get above all my work and get strategic and proactive. I'm exhausted. And this next part, Evan gives me the formula and the steps to get out of this mode. Great, applicable, practical tips are coming up. So did you get out your pen and paper? Because you're going to want to take notes in this next part. Evan gives us the biggest mistake internal communicators make when approaching a crisis. Well, I can tell you one thing that I do personally, which, which I believe is, is really helpful, and that's a concept of time blocking and basically mapping out the day ahead of time into blocks of time that are dedicated toward a certain purpose. And I think one of the biggest risks for internal communicators is it goes back to this idea of being proactive versus reactive. And if you're in a reactive footing, this and, and, and I'm sure this will sound familiar to a number of people who are listening to this podcast. You get up, sign on at nine o'clock, you, you start going through your emails, you open them up, and then boom, your day is off and running and you're getting pulled in so many different directions. And then your phone rings and then someone's texting you and then you're getting a Slack message. And before you know it, you're running around reacting to everything that's taking place around you. And you haven't actually attacked the day from a strategic standpoint. You haven't prioritized the things that are, of, are both urgent and important for the organization. And when you fall into that trap, it's, it's a really demoralizing and exhausting feeling because you get to the end of the day and you think back on the day and you go, oh man, today was crazy. I got pulled in so many directions. We got some things done, but my list is either I haven't chipped away at the things on my list or my list has gotten infinitely bigger. If you take the time the day before or or even looking at bigger blocks than just daily, but you say, you know, the most important things that really move the needle on the organization are these activities. And if you plan them and you map them out and you don't let anything interrupt them or interfere with them, and you just say, look, nine 
to 11 is the time period in which I'm collecting information from the various departments. I'm following up with people. I'm talking to them. I'm having those conversations. You commit to that and then you don't let yourself get derailed uh, by other things that, that may fly in and out. But having a structure to the day and knowing what you're doing at, at which time can help keep you really focused on what matters the most. Yeah, I love that because you're right. It's just then the day happens to you and then you feel this, you're exhausted, but you feel like I, I'll even hear people say, I didn't get anything done today. And it's, and it, it's, it is a demoralizing feeling. So I think that's such a great tip, Evan. I, I love that we're getting into this and we're getting into the, the weeds on some of these things. I think it's, they can be game changing, but so simple. So I love it. All right. Give us, give you've got one more on here, I think. What one more is is really the focusing on on the culture, focusing on their culture, showcasing what makes this company or this organization great. And at times of uncertainty, at times of great personal stress, people want stability and they want to know that they're at working for an organization that cares about them and is taking care of them and is doing the right thing. And if you take the time to remind people. Uh, even when you've got bad news to share, even when times are tough, focusing on what makes the organization a positive place can go a long way toward keeping the morale high. And at the end of the day, how people feel mentally and what their perspective is, it's, it's very fickle. And you can have go into a day, and I, I speak from personal experience on this, and, and you know, our minds are funny things, and they can play some pretty big tricks on us. You could wake up on a Monday and feel very high energy, very excited to greet the day, and then wake up the, on Tuesday and by and large, your life is the same, your reality is the same, but how you're feeling is different. Maybe you didn't sleep that well that night or your, your kid had a nightmare and ended up coming into bed in the middle of the night, so you, you, you were dealing with that. Um, your emotional state has changed, but fundamentally, the facts haven't. But how you see things changes significantly. And if that happens to each of us, and it does, it's happening with every single person at the company. Some days people are going to be up and they're going to be more positive. Some days they're going to be a little bit more down. Um, But at the end of the day, focusing on this idea that the company is on the right path and that they have a lot of things to be grateful for and thankful for goes a long way towards reminding people that it all is going to be okay. We all are in this together and we will all get through this time. So give me some of the, the great learnings, you know, on your path. I'm sure with you doing this, you know, for as long as you have been, you have seen and been in a position to see some, I'm sure, fatal mistakes like what's the biggest mistake or things that you've seen when people start to approach a crisis that we can learn from so that you can keep us from falling into a a pit here yeah well one one of the biggest problems is not having a plan in advance and so you know one of the things that covid-19 has helped people understand is that in many ways it's a reset it's a reset in our personal and professional lives And because we are not spending time fighting traffic in our cars or on trains going into the office, we actually have more time in the day that's available to us for other activities that sometimes uh, go by the wayside. You know, a friend of mine was joking the other day, he sent me some meme that was like, you know, I used to say that I never cleaned my garage out because I just didn't have the time. Well, now I know that's not why I didn't clean the garage. The implication being he's got all the time in the world, he just doesn't want to do it. Uh, Most organizations haven't got a plan in place before a crisis hits. And nine times out of 10, you can actually predict with fairly high certainty what types of crises are going to take place in your business. And so using some of this downtime now uh, to build a crisis PR, a crisis communications plan, that's a very valuable thing. And I think that internal communicators are well positioned to make the case that the, the organization needs to have this because what the events of, 
of recent months have shown more than more than anything is that uh, crises do happen. Organizations better be prepared, and if they're not prepared, then they're going to be making decisions on the fly. And what happens when when people are in a crisis situation, and we see this all the time with the clients who we counsel, when you're in the actual crisis, your ability to make rational, strategic decisions is impaired because you are feeling uh, oppressed, you're feeling hurt, you're feeling a range of emotions, everything from shock to anger to frustration to hopelessness. And it's very hard to know uh, what's real and what's in your mind. And so being able to, to step back from that and part, part of that is being prepared in advance and knowing some core things that you want to have in place. But then also there is tremendous value when you get into a situation like that is drawing upon uh, outside resources when it's appropriate who can come in. Just like when I was working at the, at the organization and they brought in outside experts who focus specifically in that arena of communications. It's helpful because then you get an outsider's perspective and you get it. Uh, you get to leverage some of their own experience and best practices and things that they've 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 handled for other companies, perhaps where the details were different, but the circumstances were were by and large the same. So that's such a good tip that it's okay that they they don't necessarily have to be an expert in crisis comms, right? You don't have to be an expert in crisis comms. You don't have to be an expert in in certain arenas. What you what you have to be though is resourceful and be that conduit for getting your organization the tools that it needs in order to be successful. You do that, you show them the value that you have and it elevates your role. And, and the role of the communicator goes from being you know, low on the totem pole or an afterthought to being someone who's really driving uh, the strategy for the organization. I'm gonna be honest and get real with you. I feel pressure. I feel pressure to be an expert in so many things, design, website, subscribing to our resources process. I feel overwhelmed. And you know what? I can't do it all. And I talked to Evan about this and he broke down for me how to relieve this pressure that we put on ourselves. He also points out two of the biggest hindrances that prevent internal communicators from showing their value. Now we're getting into the internal part of internal comms pro. So we're going internal. Let's go. Let, well, let's talk about that conduit because, you know, in your experience and, and you had talked about this as a time to reset, is there, is there a time, you know, and this is kind of the internal part of internal comms pro is there is this a time for I mean, not only internal communicators, but for everyone to kind of do a personal reset? I mean, what are some of the most successful internal communicators that you've worked with? Is do you have insight into what how they do run their personal life? I mean, as I'm sitting here thinking of all these things, I'm like, man, you've got to be on top of your game, not only you know, within your own, within your own self and in your own life to be able to get on top of this stuff, to be proactive and to see the opportunities and to have the strength to actively listen. I mean, it feels overwhelming. Give me some insight into personally, what characteristics do you see of successful internal communicators that you've worked with? Yeah. So actually I, I would, I would attack it slightly differently and say the strength it, is not necessarily within one person who's the designated internal communicator, but it's really in what's the ability of the organization to assemble a team of people who have complementary skill sets. Now, I understand if there are people listening to this who they are the, the end all be all and they are the one, one person who handles communications organization wide. Uh, it sometimes feels like a lot and it is a lot. They're a one person army. Uh, but I would suggest is even if there aren't people within his or her department who are playing that role, there are people in other departments who can be a support system. But I think the strength of the internal communications function derives in part by being able to bring together a diverse range of skill sets. And so the internal communicator shouldn't feel this pressure to be 
all things to all people, to, to be the expert on graphic design, the expert on how to write good marketing copy for, for a digital ad, the expert on how to write a speech, on how to write an op-ed, on how to do a fact-based memo with a congressional oversight committee as the intended target audience. It's very, very rare that you're going to find some unicorn out there who can do all of those things and do all of those things well. But what you can do is look at what the organization needs and break out what, what, the, what the it is. And then how do you assemble people who have that expertise that you can draw upon? And the other thing I would say is, you know, sometimes we, we, when we go in as Red Banyan and we, we engage with an organization, it's not uncommon that we'll get some pushback initially from the person who's internal communications. It tends to usually be people who are, who are younger in their earlier in their career. They haven't necessarily, they're still trying to prove themselves as opposed to individuals who've, who've earned that respect. Um, but sometimes there's an inclination to feel like I'm the expert on this organization. I know how things work and to feel almost threatened by an outside perspective or drawing on other skill sets. The contrary is actually true. Smart internal communicators know that they can leverage the learnings of all these other people and bring those to the table and make themselves, their department, and their organization not just look better, but actually be better. Gosh, that is such a good tip. But what other obstacles are out there do you see are hindering um, you know, internal communicators from really thriving and showing their value. Yeah, well, one of the biggest, what, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll tell you about two, two things that I see as huge hindrances. The first is external, and that has to do with the fact that at its most fundamental level, what, what do we as internal communicators do? We read, we write, we speak. We do it better than most people do. More effectively, we understand the nuance and, and we've developed skills over our, our careers. But by and large, that hurts us in some ways because it's these are some, some things at a basic fundamental level that anyone who's gone to school and graduated from college, they can, assuming that they're healthy and whatnot, they can read, they can write, they can speak. So I think... So many people think that they can do the jobs of communications people, but there's a big difference between being able to do it at a fundamental level enough to get by in the world versus being an expert in what you do. I can go out in the backyard with my son and he can throw me a baseball and I can wield the bat and I can hit that ball and I can do it pretty consistently. That does not make me qualified to be a batting coach in major league baseball it's not a level of expertise that's ever going to land me a cleanup hitter position for the new york yankees there's a gap between being able to perform the basic function swing the bat make contact with the ball follow through stand in the in the proper stance to do the mechanics versus being an expert in it and that expertise that gets honed and refined through the years. So I think part of it is, you know, internal communicators have to recognize that a lot of people think they can do our jobs and they're just flat wrong because yes, they could write something, but it doesn't mean it's going to be written in a way that that accomplishes the goal. That's external, but I think the other big drawback so many times is internal communicators themselves not being willing to assert themselves or feeling um, that, they, that they're powerless or that they need to be reactive, not having that self-confidence to be change agents within organizations. And part of that, I think, stems from the fact that, uh, by and large, a, lo a lot of times people who are in internal communications uh, are, very, are, are, are not necessarily motivated in the same way that spokespeople are, it's a different skill set. They tend to be more inward focused, a little bit more introverted. And I think that that can actually work against internal communicators because um, what it can do is, is we have to advocate for ourselves and you have to be willing to go to bat or not to get back to another batting metaphor. I don't know how I managed to do that, 
but you have to be willing to, to go to bat for yourself and step up to the plate and, and take some swings. And if you're not willing to advocate for yourself and make the case, there's no one else who's going to because so often uh, communications is an afterthought. But the internal communicator has to take it onto themselves, himself or herself, and, and step forward and say, listen, the value that we provide is significant. And you have to be willing to not just talk about the mechanics of what you do, which is not going to win anybody over. But if you talk about the value of it and how it helps the organization, that's when you start to resonate with folks who, who otherwise wouldn't necessarily understand the value that internal communicators bring to the table. Okay, friends, we're coming up on the last part of this episode, and you know I'm going to push Evan down the how do we show our value rabbit hole. So Evan broke down for me how we can show our value in two steps, and he gives us his two favorite books that every internal communicator should read. I would also love to connect with you. Let me know how you liked this episode. Is an hour too long? Do you like it if we break these episodes into short 30 minutes? Let me know. I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn or shoot me an email at sarah, S-A-R-A, at internalcomspro.com. So to, to keep on going down this rabbit hole, how do you coach the internal communicator to demonstrate and share that value? Where does their value lie? Yeah, so I can tell you within my own organization, part of, of what I mentor and coach my team to understand is uh, there are really two steps for us getting a result for a client. And step one is getting the result. So that means say your organization uh, hires us because you're an expert on gun violence and you wanna be quoted in a piece about gun violence. Step one is we get you quoted. You appear in the article. Um, step two is once you've achieved the result, educating the client. And for internal communicators, the client may be an internal client. It may be a department, and it typically is a department within an organization or the leadership team, et cetera. But step two is explaining the value of what you've done to the client. And if you've only done step one, then you haven't finished the job. You're only halfway there. And I think that that's a, a crucial element that internal communicators need to be reminded of. And you need to think, you know, it's not enough to just explain the what of what I've done. It's explain the value. What's the value to the organization? So, you know, being called on to give a report in a, in a meeting and saying, we did X, we did Y, we did Z. We did this, we sent out a newsletter, we, at, we, you know, we, we, we ferreted out a couple of stories and we put out a press release. Okay, but what's the value? And if you're not communicating the value and the why behind, why did you choose to do that? What did you learn from it? And what's the value for the organization? Then you haven't really done, done your job completely. The other tip I would say is, we can always get better um, at, at areas where um, perhaps we lack the confidence or the self-assurance. And there's so much information out there and so many tools at our disposal. The key is being able to just find ones that you know will help you. Personally, I always tell people, you know, reading, reading books, reading business books, reading self-improvement books, I think are a a critical part of, of always getting better. I think specifically, you know, some books that I can think of that I think internal communicators should read. I think they should read this book by this guy, Oren Clough, called Pitch Anything. Uh, I think that's an invaluable book that talks about how you make the case and how you explain, uh, how you tell a story. So many of the elements of what we talked about in terms of what are things that internal communicators should be doing right now in the COVID-19 crisis are covered in that book. I think Pitch Anything is, is a great book to do. The other book that, that I read literally once or twice a year, I always come back to it as a, as a guidepost, is a book um, called uh, The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. It's not even a business book. It's more of a life book, but it talks about identifying uh, what are your areas, your, your zones of incompetence, your zone of competence, your zone of genius. And if you can... Be really self-aware 
and identify the areas where you are experiencing a state of flow, where you're in the zone, you're in your state of genius. Knowing what those areas are is helpful, but even more helpful is knowing those areas where you're not necessarily an expert. And there it becomes, is it worth it to develop, the, uh, to put in the time and the effort uh, or the investment to get better in those areas or to draw upon the expertise of other people for whom those are their, their areas of expertise. So a couple, couple tips that I hope people can, can yeah. use. That's so good. I love all of this. Those two points of saying, identify the result. I think so many times the communicator, they do not see themselves as the leader. I think oftentimes, because you're right, the, and I heard, and I don't remember who said it, but it was so funny. I heard at a conference, somebody say, people treat it communicators. It would be the same if the communicator went to an architect and said, you want me to look at that blueprint for you? <laughs> you know, it's insane to think that, that, they that they would think that way but instead of to you know get into victim mentality how do we get above that and take responsibility and say okay i am the leader and oftentimes i think leadership is like yes we need to get this out there but it is the wise communicator who has blocked out their day and is intentional to be of sound mind enough to ask what is the result you're looking for Right to have them say it and pinpoint it. What is the employee behavior that you're wanting to derive, and that they've got to lead leadership into really thinking through what is it that you're actually wanting these employees to do, so that they can have them identify the result and then to show how where is that value, and if they want really want the pro tip. This is the pro part of internal comms. Pro is to tie it to then the bottom line and the strategic business objectives of the organization, boy, they're, they're to go back to your batting analogy, they're hitting a home run at that point. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough. All of these tips are so wonderful. I love this, um, awareness that it's not linear. You're going to jump from thing to thing. And, and the fact we've got all these in a cheat sheet, we'll put them on our website and um, also, if, if people do want to get in touch with you and your company, where, where do they go? How can they reach you? Sure. Well, they can, they can find us online at redbanion.com. You can look me up personally. I'm on LinkedIn. I do accept invites from people I haven't yet met. Evan Nearman. Uh, I think I'm probably the only Evan Nearman on LinkedIn, so you should be able to find me. And you can obviously find us also on our social media, Red Banion PR. On Twitter, Red Banyan has a Facebook page. We also have Instagram and a YouTube channel. So we'd love to hear from you. So we welcome the opportunity to, to connect with your listeners and, and to all work together because communicators have a vital role to play and uh, organizations rely on us. And we need to just have the confidence and the self-assuredness in order to help educate them about the value that we bring to the table. Well, and like the banyan tree, we can all grow together. I can't thank you enough for your time today, Evan. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Really enjoyed this. Internal Comms Pro Podcast is produced by Super Awesome Media. Our theme music is Hard Fought Victory by Purple Planet Music. Thank you for listening.